Hello, this is Tom Ivers and welcome to our videotape on interval training the thoroughbred. The concept of interval training is not a difficult one to understand. Uh, the application of interval training is rather difficult to perform because of the problems associated with doing lots of work with uh, thoroughbred racehorses. The problems arise uh, not only in the horses themselves but in the people that are handling the horses. Some of the people can't uh, handle the work and can't uh, wrap their minds around the entire concept of scientific training. So this this tape is designed uh, for those of you who can understand that uh, uh, science has a place in the conditioning of athletes and it has a place in the conditioning of equine athletes especially. Uh, equine athletes are a product of human endeavor. They're a product of human shaping. And our job is to try to manufacture the very best product, the most durable product, and the most uh, essentially profitable product that we can as trainers. The whole process begins with mileage and the reason that mileage is necessary there are several reasons uh, mileage uh, builds workload now what uh, what workload is is the capacity to do work in the horse uh, if you go build up to a mile a day then you've got a horse that has the capacity to do a little bit more than a mile a day you build up to five miles a day, you have a horse that has the capacity to do a little bit more than five miles a day. Uh, if you build to two miles and stay there, uh, and stay there for 60 days or 90 days, you still have a horse that can only do or have the capacity to do a little more than two miles a day. In other words, the horse's body, like the human body, like every animal body, living organism uh, adapts to stresses in the environment and uh, depending on how you apply those stresses uh, if you apply them gradually and carefully uh, there is a continuous change there's a continuous upgrading of the ability of the uh, organism to uh, handle the stresses of the environment if you expose the organism to too much stress at once then tissues break down and you're back to zero or you're uh, back to worse than zero you you end up with a, a cripple so our job here building a workout is to build the ability in the horse to handle certain levels of stress and then when we start building mileage all we're building is the ability to handle muscular activity for a period of time uh, 10 minutes then 15 minutes then 20 minutes then 30 minutes then 40 minutes uh, however long we can afford to go through the training process in, in the background mileage stage, uh, we can build the equine athlete to uh, withstand uh, any number of minutes of exercise. Uh, people race thoroughbreds, ex-race horse thoroughbreds, uh, for 50 to 100 miles at a time. Uh, we're not asking in, a, in an interval training program to do that, but just so that you know that uh, thoroughbreds, Arabians, uh, quarter horses, uh, any nag off the prairie can go out and deliver in a paddock. Your typical uh, thoroughbred left alone in a large paddock will give 22 miles a day of just plain uh, hop, skip and jump exercise, uh, free exercise by himself. So <coughs> it's not an impossibility to build a horse to a significant level of workload uh, on a daily basis. Now when we build workload, uh, the, uh, a second thing we're building uh, is the ability to process energy, the ability to take in food, uh, digest it, uh, pull out the uh, energy uh, components that of that feed and turn that energy into uh, action on the on the racetrack. Uh, you'll find that a horse that does 10 miles a day uh, can eat more and can digest more and can use more fuel than a horse that's doing only one mile a day. Uh, another thing we do, uh, and this is common in human athletes, uh, uh, is building the endorphin response or the <coughs> 
basically a, a happiness response to exercise. The more exercise humans and equines do, uh, the, the happier they are. In fact, uh, human e uh, athletes that are training for marathons and this type of thing sometimes become addicted uh, to hard exercise. They have to exercise hard. Now here, all we're talking about is building uh, to a six mile day, slowly. Uh, and b uh, roughly every four days, we can add a half mile of uh, gallop to the just broke horse, assuming that you spend 30 days uh, breaking an animal. And at that point, he's willing to, or is uh, capable of going a, a mile at a, at a nice lope. Then uh, uh, every four days, you can safely add a half mile of exercise to that daily workout, all of it at the same time. Um, and build from a mile to a mile and a half to two miles, two miles and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five, five and a half, six, all on a daily basis, all on a continuous mileage base, uh, until you have run out of your uh, budgeted time to deliver uh, your background mileage stage, which is roughly one third of the time that you uh, budget uh, for the entire training process. As we go through this training uh, stage, we're beginning with the beginning to build the hardest thing to build in the animal, and that's structural toughness, structural soundness. And throughout the rest of the training process, we are going to continue to build structural soundness, tendons, ligaments, bone, uh, cartilage in the knee joints and the ankle joints, all of these things thicken and get tougher and get uh, more able to withstand uh, heavier and longer exercise. Uh, one of the errors we don't want to make when we're in the middle of this uh, background mileage stage is to go too slow with the animal. If the horse uh, learns to do just straight up and down hobby horse gallop, gets experiencing that too long, then later on what we're going to find is we have specifically trained this horse for up and down hobby horse exercise, and the animal has difficulty then stretching out into a nice open lope, a racing lope, the kind of stride that you want to see when uh, you take the horse to the races. Now once we've built it to six miles, uh, what we know then is that we can actually perform three miles of in more intensive work twice a week uh, coming from this background mileage stage. And the whole idea of building background mileage is that eventually we want to be able to do large quantities of race-specific work. But we have to pass through uh, a second stage of conditioning before we get into race-specific work, and that is the cardiovascular development stage. If we skip this stage, we end up with horses that uh, can develop speed but uh, cannot uh, stay and cannot uh, withstand the high lactate levels that uh, speed automatically produces. So we uh, go from stage one, the background mileage stage, into stage two, the cardiovascular stage. And what we'll do here is uh, twice a week, uh, we'll start with uh, three times one mile uh, heats and these uh, th each of these miles is separated by a 10 minute active rest period during which the whatever lactate levels have been built and not many not much lactate will be built during the early stages of cardiovascular conditioning but in the latter stages of it quite a lot of lactate is going, going to be built but what we're trying to do in the stage in the second stage of conditioning is to uh, build the plumbing in the horse, build the oxygen delivery system uh, so that later on when the horse is uh, going through a high intensity exercise uh, it has the capacity to use lactate as a fuel to burn that lactate. So the first thing we need to do is develop heart and lungs, the cardiovascular system and it's a very difficult system in the horse to stress uh, to get a conditioning effect because the horse uh, has a spleen that uh, sequesters uh, roughly 50% of its red blood cells away from bloodstream until such time as the tiger jumps out of the bush and causes an adrenaline reaction and the spleen contracts and dumps all those extra uh, oxygen carrying troops into the bloodstream. 
So when we do a, a cardiovascular workout, the first thing we have to do is make sure that the spleen does uh, dump and get uh, emptied into the uh, uh, bloodstream. And then we have to go on and continue to test and try the oxygen delivery system so that the muscle cells begin to cry out for more oxygen. When that occurs, uh, there will be a response, a, a building of cardiovascular capacity. Now you're going to be watching a horse here that is in the very last stages of uh, uh, cardiovascular conditioning, uh, still doing three times one mile. Early on, uh, this horse started out with the fastest of the three miles in about three minutes. But now uh, the horse is uh, uh, moving on down into uh, f uh, faster rates of speed, uh, still doing three times one, one mile. And what we try to do with the three times one mile is keep a 10 second spread between each mile. In other words, uh, three minutes, 250, 240, 240, 230, 220, gradually sneaking down, slice by slice, taking off the speed, tiptoeing down into more and more aggressive speeds. Uh, at this case right here, we're looking at a horse that uh, is supposed to be going uh, 215, 205, and 155. Now, it's not, uh, with most riders, it's not possible to accurately uh, hit these fractions. Uh, in fact, uh, we s most often are at the side of the track with a radio talking to the rider, telling him how fast he's going and to pick it up a little or slow down a little, try to, try to control that workout so we don't go too fast too soon. Uh, and that's the biggest problem, always the biggest problem, is that uh, it's not making the horse do the work, but preventing the horse from over-exercising, from going, uh, plunging itself into fatigue, allowing those fetlocks to drop to the ground and uh, uh, cause injury to the, to the animal. So in this case, uh, you're going to see a workout that goes a little bit uh, too quick. Uh, also, on this uh, workout, we are taking recovery heart rates for these miles as the horse uh, goes through them so that we can see uh, how deeply we dug into the cardiovascular system, how much uh, uh, oxygen deficit did we uh, cause with the exercise. And we have to be very careful that we don't plunge the horse into fatigue in that third of the three miles uh, or drive the horse into fatigue or suck the horse along with company into fatigue uh, in any of these workouts. Uh, the whole idea is to avoid uh, crippling injury while developing a large volume of exercise that will specifically condition the horse for the things we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for oxidative capacity oxygen deliver, delivery capacity and oxidative uptake capacity in the, uh, in the muscle cells. Now we're still dealing with a horse that uh, uh, is uh, at this case, in this position right now, uh, where the horse in that first wor workout went in 216 and had a recovery heart rate of 108, uh, we didn't trigger many fast twitch muscle cells to fire during that particular heat. Uh, mostly that was slow twitch workout that was uh, still way up into the cardiovascular exercise area and not much lactate was, was produced and not much fast twitch work was being done. As the thoroughbred approaches two minutes though, uh, most of the exercise load is passed to the fast twitch muscle cells. And these are the key muscle cells. These are the muscle cells that are going to be operating in a race. The slow twitch muscle cells will never operate in a race. And consequently what we have here is a horse going through now a second heat in which uh, he'll dig deeper into his musculature. He'll uh, trigger and recruit more fast twitch muscle cells to fire. And these fast twitch muscle cells will run out of fuel and pass the work to other fast twitch muscle cells. They'll uh, become deficient in oxygen and cry out for oxygen uh, to help burn the lactate that is starting to pile up in there uh, within the, the muscle cells. And as that happens, uh, one of the changes that will take place is uh, mitochondria material, little factories in the muscle cells that uh, burn lactate and burn other fuels uh, through the use of oxygen, burn that fuel to completion. Uh, 
uh, will start to build within those muscle cells and enzyme, oxidative enzymes will be stored away in those muscle cells and the muscle cells will tend to get fat with fuel. The more you draw down the fuel, the, uh, the more the fuel replenishes itself and, the, and the, the body, the horse's body, will always overcompensate. You have a stress recovery rebound cycle and at the end of the rebound cycle after the horse has recovered from the workout and has come back and is ready for more work you've got a point of supercompensation and that supercompensation means that the horse can do more today than he was able to do three days ago in the last uh, exercise. If he worked an interval workout on Tuesday, then on Friday he's more capable than he was on Tuesday to perform the exercise. He's got more stored fuel, he's got more stored enzymes, he's starting to build oxidative capacity in his muscle cells. The trouble with building cardiovascular system and the oxidative capacity is that it's a tissue change. It's not a fueling change. Uh, building fuel in fast twitch muscle cells happens very quickly and in the final stages of conditioning uh, we're going to get plenty of that done. But first we have to change the tissues. We have to change the heart-lung interface. We have to build capillary beds. We've got to prevent this horse from exploding his lungs with high intensity exercise, double thick blood, a heart rate that jumps from a resting rate of 33 to a firing rate of 240 and blows out those tiny capillaries in the lungs. We have to prevent that by building a much stronger cardiovascular network of uh, uh, blood and oxygen delivery. Okay, so the second heat in this workout was uh, a 203 mile with a recovery heart rate of 114. Now 114 suggests to us, and this heart rate was taken one minute after the horse crossed the finish line. In other words, the horse crosses the finish line, slows down, comes to a stop, and immediately right then the heart rate is taken. And that's precisely one minute after the horse crosses the finish line. If you want to rely on my numbers, then you, know, you have to take your heart rates at one minute after the finish line. At that point, a 114 heart rate tells us that, sure enough, we did dig somewhat deeply into the animal's capacity for work, uh, the animal's capacity for uh, living with the lactate he's producing, uh, but we didn't dig so far that we can't go on then with a third heat, a third interval, work interval, uh, safely. And so here we go with, with, with a third heat. Now this, this heat's going to go a little too quick. Uh, I think I'm not sure, but I think it's going to go in about 147, and we're going to we're going to see a heart rate uh, response to that, a recovery heart rate uh, in excess of 120. Danger zones in heart rates that say uh, in this kind of exercise that tell you, hey, the workout is over, no more heats today, uh, are heart rates that uh, are in excess of 135. Now between 125 and 135, then you start uh, asking questions to your rider. How does the horse feel? Did the horse uh, like that piece of work, uh, et cetera? Uh, you want to uh, be careful between 125 and 135, and you want to stop a workout uh, completely at uh, uh, heart rates that are in excess of uh, 135, one minute after the heat of exercise. Of course, uh, after and during this entire process, uh, we have continued building the structural systems that we started way back on day one. Uh, we've also done some uh, neuromuscular coordination uh, conditioning in the animal. Now uh, the stride has become more fluid. The, uh, the animal is uh, much more efficient at uh, a racing level stride. There you saw a heart rate of uh, 126 after that exercise. It tells you, all that tells you is that the workout is over. Uh, nice job, did a real good job of digging deep into the animal's uh, cardiovascular system, and this horse should be able to come back uh, three or four days from now with another workout that's a little bit tougher. The monitoring process that uh, we should be using throughout the uh, conditioning uh, uh, of the thoroughbred uh, includes uh, the use of a heart rate monitor. Uh, it's a vital tool. We have to know where we are. We want to know precisely where we are all the way through. Nothing by accident, nothing by ear. Uh, we want to know precisely what we're getting done and what we're not getting done and if we're going too far. In the middle of some of these more in high intensity exercises you're going to uh, 
really need to know how far along uh, you are. Now what you're watching here is a horse having a heart rate meter placed on it, an onboard heart rate meter. First uh, to go on are the uh, electrode patches that uh, the, the acetone is rubbed on the hair of the horse to get the oils off it and then the patch is stuck on and it's pressed around the outside uh, quite, quite hard and uh, then the uh, middle uh, part of the electrode that has the gel on it is pushed in and once the patches are stuck on then uh, you can uh, saddle the horse and hook up uh, the transmitter. You'll see the transmitter in a minute. Now the, the heart rate meter is a, is a vital tool and in this case what we have is a, is a meter that uh, we call the VMAX that uh, can be worn by the rider uh, also remembers the entire workout so it can play it back for you when you come off the track. You can see how that heart rate curve went throughout the workout. Uh, and the rider is not attached to the horse with wires. That's one of the problems with some of the other heart rate meters is that uh, if the rider falls off the horse, $500 worth of instrument or $800 or $1,000 worth of instrument is uh, destroyed and you have to go uh, buy another one. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a little transmitter that's sequestered in the uh, uh, blanket and it broadcasts the two or three feet necessary a dirty blanket. Uh, necessary to uh, reach the watch that the rider is wearing. And uh, that watch then uh, tells the rider what the heart rate is. And you, you can say to the rider, look, uh, in this particular workout, let's just do four miles, uh, uh, but let's keep it uh, fast enough to get the heart rate at uh, 160 beats a minute uh, and slow enough not to exceed 190 beats a minute. We want to stay within the range of uh, uh, the horse's steady state or the ability to keep working without uh, an oxygen deficit and without piling up uh, high levels of uh, lactate. Uh, this horse is being uh, saddled at Cornell University. Cornell University has an extensive uh, exercise physiology research program going on and in fact uh, Dr. George Malin is the person who uh, took this human heart rate monitor and uh, redesigned it to uh, work with horses with these electrode patches. Um, it's a very accurate heart rate meter. One of the problems with some of the other heart rate meters is that uh, some of them stick under the girth and the rubbing on the girth throws out artifact that is picked up by the heart rate meter and uh, uh, you get an erroneous reading and uh, you don't want an erroneous reading uh, just because you've got a nice pretty curve where the heart rate goes from 80 to 120 to 190 to 210 and back to 180 uh, if it's wrong numbers uh, it's all a lie and you just don't know where you are uh, in the workout. So in this case, what we have is a heart rate meter that is artifact free. It, it doesn't throw out false numbers. Uh, and in fact, if, a, if one of the electrodes come, comes loose uh, or a patch falls off or whatever, then the, uh, the horse, the, the watch, stops reading. It just comes up blank and then you have to stop and reattach the uh, electrode. Now, unfortunately, the uh, camera crew at uh, Cornell University is not quite as good as George's chemistry crew, and uh, we have a film here of these horses going about their exercise uh, on a uh, grass track that George has built out behind the exercise physiology laboratory, and it uh, flops around a little bit, but you'll get an idea how these things are used. The people that are uh, supervising the exercise, including Dr. Malin, uh, are standing alongside this uh, track and watching these horses perform, and as the riders go by, they uh, call out the uh, heart rates that the horses are experiencing. Now, they don't have to call out these heart rates uh, because the, uh, the watch uh, remembers. So th they'll take these heart rate watches back to the laboratory and play them into the computer, and the computer will give a complete readout of every heart rate to uh, every step the horse is, uh, is taking during this exercise. Uh, the horses in question here are not that uh, fit, they're just beginning their exercises and so consequently we're going to see uh, some relatively high heart rates, uh, uh, abnormally high heart rates on these, on these horses. Um, Later on, though, uh, the heart rate
rates will settle down. The horses will become more and more fit until pretty soon the same level of exercise will produce hardly any heart rate at all. You can see that it's pretty easy for the kids to look at the watches. They don't really have to exaggerate and, and reach out their arm to see the watch. Uh, and in fact, don't have to uh, come up with a number for the, uh, for the trainer during the ride. The recovery heart rate is the key heart rate. And if you want to see the whole thing, you can play the heart rate that watches memory back. Stenero was a horse that was interval trained by Frank Dunn of Ireland, and her workloads went as high as 15 miles a day. Uh, twice a week, sometimes three times a week, she'd do five miles worth of exercise. And here she is in the Japan Cup. <laughs> Scenario's number is 14. She's in the black and yellow stripes with the rider having a pink hat. That's not her there. She's way at the back of the pack at this point. But she's number 14, and you'll see her make her move. There he is, way in the back of the pack. Okay, now she'll make her move a little later in the uh, race. Uh, Frank never trained this horse faster than 12 second eighths. So she's a slow mover out of the gate, but she just logs along and develops some real firepower or comparative firepower late in the race. Okay, let's listen to see what it sounds like. <laughs> Stenair is still not in sight, and the star of the show at this point is a look like a quarter horse being ridden by an idiot, and uh, you'll see the results of that kind of a ride in just a minute. There's Stenera right there, under a nice hold, uh, biding her time. Now watch the quarter horse spit it out here. He's all done. He needs a drink, trip to the bar. He's going to back everybody up, and the outside of the pack is going to start to go around. The whole crew is bunched up. They're all still kind of laying, not really trying to do any hard work, but uh, the sprinter, he's all done. He's, he's going to be last. Right about now, the Japanese are going to learn to pronounce a new difficult name. That's Japanese for look at that mother go. Frank Dunn called me from Ireland, from Japan that night and told me it was a dream come true. He spent a year building this animal. Before we do any heavy exercise, fast exercise uh, on a given day, we take the horse out of the stall, 
like to walk it up and down some concrete or some flat surface, hard surface, just to see uh, how well the horse likes its legs, uh, how well the horse feels. Uh, you're looking at a horse here, the horse that you'll be seeing going through some faster workouts, and the horse that you saw going through the cardiovascular stages, uh, who is nowhere near perfect in confirmation. Uh, uh, she's a four-year-old mare. Uh, who has been through the interval training uh, process uh, a couple times. Now at this, at this stage, she's out in California at Westerly Training Center <clears throat> and doing very well, liking the exercise, but she's always had uh, boggy ankles. Uh, she was trained by uh, someone who didn't know what they were doing early on uh, as a two-year-old, and uh, her ankles uh, had some pathology in them that uh, now is uh, going to be there for forever. So we have to watch those ankles and make sure that we don't upset the synovial fluid and upset the synovial membrane and cause further damage. Have to control whatever damage is, uh, is there. Uh, she also has uh, a check ligament that has scar tissue on it for, uh, again, s similar reasons way back when uh, she was... Uh, probably taken too fast too soon and the check ligament didn't like that kind of exercise and uh, it uh, had some tears in it which uh, scarred over and uh, now occasionally the check ligament shows up and takes another look at us uh, however you can look at the horse's body and you can see that uh, there is some uh, muscular development there uh, you can tell that the horse is uh, uh, calm and collected and happy and uh, bright-eyed and uh, bushy-tailed, uh, uh, good-looking animal. Now look at these legs. Uh, these are uh, very imperfect legs, uh, very imperfect feet. She has uh, down in the lower legs of the ankle, she always carries a little bit of uh, swelling down there, right, right in that area right there. Uh, always has had a little bit of uh, oscillates going on, a little bit of uh, knee uh, heat, uh, a little bit again of uh, check ligament in that left front. Uh, bad feet, horrible feet, uh, but nevertheless uh, you'll see her doing some works that uh, you just won't believe uh, that a thoroughbred, any thoroughbred can do. Uh, and this, here we are with a very imperfect animal uh, whose structural systems have been built very gradually over a long period of time so that whatever conformational defects she has, her body has accommodated those uh, defects and she's perfectly capable of going out and doing uh, what we're asking her to do. We know she's capable and uh, she knows she's capable. She's not afraid of the work. Uh, she's perfectly uh, willing and actually the biggest job with her is to keep her from overdriving, from uh, moving too fast. There you see the vola part pouch area there that is always a little puffy. Uh, too bad, but uh, that's the way you get a horse once in a while. All you can do is, uh, oscillate area there, all you can do is keep those uh, areas under control. And uh, probably the very best way of, uh, of all ways to keep that under control is with uh, cryotherapy or cooling, icing, um, after, after the exercise. Um, we'll show you that in, a, in just a second. Um, you can tell now that the owner of the horse is the one that is uh, looking after her legs and you can tell that this horse is what most race trainers would call a baby uh, or a babied horse, a pampered horse, a spoiled horse uh, but actually this horse is a very well taken care of horse and uh, they're looking at her ankles and her knees and her legs every day very closely and if anything uh, goes on that they don't like uh, the problem is treated, the workouts are backed up, and the problem is treated, and then you go on with go on with the horse. This is a horse that has been stopped and started quite a, quite a lot, a lot of times uh, so that no severe injuries take place. Uh, to keep those ankles tight, one of the things we've used is a drug called Adequan uh, in the muscle and not in the joints. We don't go into the joints with anything. 
what the Atacuan was very effective uh, in controlling the uh, the swelling of these ankles. We don't want the ankles to be <coughs> swelling to the point where they uh, stretch the tissues and get real boggy and then start to get sore uh, on the horse and start to make the horse think that uh, it's incapable of doing the exercise, that it's intolerant to the exercise. We keep close tracks of her, close track of her toe lengths and her uh, angles of her feet. Uh, don't use any toe grabs on her. Uh, we have a little device here that we can uh, stick right on top of the foot and get the effective angle uh, immediately without having to use a protractor. A protractor is almost always invariably a couple degrees off, especially if uh, you've got those idiot toe grabs on the on the front feet. So here we've got the angle finder that just uh, tells us what the angle is. Uh, and we check it often. And when the angle gets too low or the two toe gets too long, again, there's a ruler on the uh, angle finder so we can tell exactly how long the toe is. When it gets out of line, and this typically happens uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three weeks into a shoeing, uh, we retrim and uh, pull that toe back, keep the ankle, uh, the heels high or as high as we can keep them. Again, her feet are not perfect. You can tell that her feet have been uh, abused in the past. So what we're trying to do here is keep them under control, keep them uh, so that she can break over easily on them, not get fatigued trying to break over on them, uh, not have to stumble over a toe grab. Uh, the toe grabs that were on these shoes have been rasped or been uh, ground off. Uh, and she's very, very comfortable on her feet. And you'll see, and when she works out, that uh, uh, she does not get fatigued because of uh, improper shoeing. Instead, she's uh, capable of doing a lot more work than most thoroughbred trainers uh, would ever admit uh, is possible with a horse. Uh, the little fellow there that's uh, fooling around with her feet is uh, the son of the owner. and. Uh, You'll find that uh, these horses are very gentle. Uh, horses that do a lot of work uh, during the week are gentle, push-button, kind animals. Now here's the cryotherapy. We're taking polo bandages and uh, putting them in a mixture, half alcohol, half water, and then filled with uh, ice. And we just soak those bandages in that water. And when the horse comes off the uh, track after a workout, we uh, wrap uh, two bandages on each leg, all the way up past the knee, all the way up past the hocks. And uh, there, okay, so you, now you can see what that bandage looks like. Good looking red haired kid there. So we take the bandages over to the horse after the workout and uh, wrap her from uh, above the knee using two bandages per leg all the way down. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a tight wrap. In fact, it's kind of a loose wrap. And uh, as the bandages are wrapped uh, uh, at the knee, uh, we'll then let that cold, icy, alcohol, evaporating water uh, cool those areas and contract the blood vessels underneath the skin and keep those boggy areas from swelling out with edema. Uh, when they do swell out and puff out, and if they're not controlled, then uh, the problem gets worse and worse and worse and worse until finally the horse is just very sore. The synovial uh, joint and the fluid is all over the place. It's uh, corrupted with uh, edema. Uh, the tissues bag out, and uh, the horse looks and feels horrible. Once the bandages are on, the legs, we, uh, for 20 minutes after they're on, uh, we make little pockets in the bandages and pour the uh, ice water uh, down into those pockets. Um, 20 minutes uh, of this kind of treatment uh, causes the blood vessels to contract and contract, uh, doing it much more than 20 minutes though, bringing the uh, the internal temperature of that leg down below 15 degrees centigrade will cause the reverse reaction. What will happen is all the blood vessels, the leg suddenly uh, concludes that it's freezing and uh, uh, needs to be uh, warmed up so the blood vessels expand and the whole blood, si blood supply explodes back into the leg and 
you'll cause more edema than you're than you're looking for. So 20 minutes of of icy water is the limit that you want to go. You don't want to go much longer than that. Otherwise, you'll get that uh, uh, freezing response. We're just going to show you the front two legs, uh, but uh, in all of the horses that we put through this type of a program, we do all four legs uh, after the workouts. And the back legs, uh, again, with two bandages on them, uh, we do the uh, bandages up past the hocks uh, behind. The, uh, that's not alcohol going in there, that is uh, the water that's been uh, sucked out of the bucket uh, with that little plastic bottle. And the water just kind of seeps down through the bandages all the way down past the foot to the ground. The horse's immune system is such that uh, it tends to overreact to even the slightest of uh, traumas or irritations. And it reacts by attempting to immobilize the joint by swelling and uh, throwing off pain. And the problem with that is that uh, in some of these more minor uh, situations, uh, especially when you're trying to get a horse ready to go to the races, uh, more damage occurs than the original uh, problem would, would justify. So the idea is to uh, attack uh, the results of this immune response or this uh, healing response in the horse to keep it under control so that uh, you're able to go on with your training program and uh, without um, without stopping or without having to adjust a great deal in your in your exercise protocol. It turns out that cryotherapy or cold therapy is probably the most effective of any therapy in this in this kind of a situation. The other things that uh, have been tried are uh, squeezing wraps and poultices and this type of thing but uh, and then lasers and pulsating magnetic fields and uh, uh, the use of butazolidin or other anti-inflammatories. Uh, those an anti-inflammatories are quite useful in a critical situation where you've uh, just severely injured a tendon or an ankle and uh, the swelling is uh, great uh, and you need to control it immediately. Uh, those uh, anti-inflammatory drugs are very useful, but even then, the most effective of all therapies is ice cold. Uh, that sucks down the vasculature and uh, limits the circulation in the area and limits the pooling of these dangerous and annoying fluids. Refrigerated ice wraps uh, are not as effective as uh, ice water. Um, the uh, electronic icing machines or refrigerating machines are not as effective. Uh, whirlpools can be a, as effective if they're uh, very cold, but then you have to be quite careful with whirlpools. Uh, leaving the horse in there too long, you'll get into uh, that big trouble of expanding blood vessels rather than contracting. The final stage of conditioning is not a very distinct uh, difference uh, moving from cardiovascular work into uh, race-specific exercise. But here we'll see that uh, uh, going from triple miles, we move on down into four times three quarter uh, intervals, three quarter mile intervals uh, with seven minute rest periods between them. And uh, 10 seconds spread between the slowest and fastest of the, uh, of the multiple heats. Uh, the workout you're, we're going to look at here, there are two workouts coming up. These are actually tapering back workouts. These are um, two triple five-eighths workouts with gallop out to uh, three quarters. The horse is BB Magic. This is the same horse we've been watching doing the other 
works. This horse has, has been able to do four time three quarter workouts, uh, fastest of the three quarters of the four three quarters in 114. Um, at this point, we're tapering back. We're going for slightly sharper final heats. And what we're hoping to accomplish uh, with this, and if you look at the, uh, uh, the worksheets on your um, uh, documentation that came with this tape, you'll see that um, <clears throat> we don't uh, spend a whole lot of time down into real short works. In fact, 5 uh workouts are as short really as we want to go unless we're definitely lacking in outright speed in the animal. Usually by the time the horse gets down to 5 uh, there's plenty of firepower, and, and in fact the whole job is to hold the horse from going too fast. Um, too fast when you get down into this kind of speed um, at this kind of volume uh, you need significant recovery not only for the muscular systems and the uh, fueling systems but also for the structural systems which do sustain some damage during high speed uh, exercise the faster you go the more damage you can expect because of that high level of concussion Plus, the faster you go, the more opportunity there is for the horse to um, take a misstep. Um, the more volume of high-speed work you get, the more opportunity there is for a misstep. So we don't like to concentrate down in this area with too much in the way of too many workouts in a row of high-speed work. If we've got the speed we're looking for, we know for sure that we've built the ability to uh, stay uh, for a distance, but uh, these multiple three-quarter efforts that start somewhere around uh, fastest uh, three-quarter and 130 and work all the way down to fastest three-quarter in, in about 114, we're still building there the ability uh, of the uh, animal to oxidize lactate, and this is the key to sustainable high speed. So the multiple three quarters are uh, a real important uh, section of this workout and cannot be skipped. Now these workouts you're about to you're observing right now are uh, multiple five eighths actually with gallop outs to three quarters. In other words, the horse the the rider stands up on the horse at the five eighths and just uh, starts gradually hauling the horse in. Uh, you can see that though that these um, <coughs> exercises are fast. Uh, also that the horse uh, is very willing. We're, uh, we have uh, a stethoscope out on the track that uh, immediately after the, uh, uh, the heat takes place, uh, at one minute after crossing the finish line, the heart rate is taken. That is our recovery heart rate. We're watching very closely now the uh, recovery heart rate. We're uh, sticking fast to our rule that um, the higher heart rate recoveries are indica in indicative of the necessity to stop the workout. And uh, the rider's uh, judgment as far as how the horse feels is also coming into a great deal of uh, importance here. If the horse feels aggressive, feels like it wants to move on, then uh, with the heart rate information uh, as a backup, and with the fact that we're still slicing time, uh, very little at a time, to slicing speed off this horse's performance, very little at a time, uh, then we go ahead and complete the entire workout. If, on the other hand, the first heat goes in target time, but the second heat goes in the fourth heat's uh, target time, uh, the workout is over for that day, and we try to find a way to uh, keep the horse under control, um, better control uh, during the during these workouts. And one of the ways to do that is the day before uh, an exercise like this uh, to do some long, slow mileage, some uh, fuel draining mileage, so that you don't have the horse standing on his tiptoes, ready to fire at the at the first sign of uh, any kind of uh, incentive. Uh, instead, what you want is the horse a little bit sleepy going into workouts like these. And you want a, an extremely competent rider who has uh, uh, control of the animal. And after this, after this pair of workouts you're looking at, uh, we'll have an extended interview with 
the the rider that's riding the horse currently that you're looking at, uh, and he'll be talking about how he maintains that kind of control and how a horse feels going through this kind of a workout so that your rider, when it's when she or he is uh, up on a horse doing this kind of high-speed, aggressive, multiple heat exercise, uh, your rider will know how that horse feels or should feel and what to do to maintain control. Now, one of the unfortunate uh, aspects of the rider we're watching is uh, he's one of those old-time AC Ducey uh, riders where the outside stirrup is uh, higher than the inside stirrup. Um, and <clears throat> there is no way to change that on this rider because uh, he's been doing it for... I don't know how many years, 20 years, uh, and he's so used to balancing himself that way that uh, should he be asked to bring his stirrups to level, uh, he'll go out of balance. Later on, this in this particular horse right here, this caused a significant problem in that uh, uh, where the rider's knee hit the uh, shoulder of the horse, uh, a baseball-sized hematoma developed because of the, of the rider leaning into that shoulder. And she got very sore on it, and we had to back off and uh, uh, give her a break and then come back on uh, with the works. So the AC Ducey rider is not uh, not the best of all worlds. Uh, however, uh, far better to have a rider balanced properly on a horse than to have a rider uh, uh, sagging from side to side or front to back and completely unbalanced and throwing uh, odd uh, stresses and odd uh, conditions at the horse as the horse is trying to perform high speed uh, intense exercise pro protocols. And you can see this is the part of the workout where, or the part of the heat where the horse is slowing down and uh, still being clocked though for the three quarters here, the three quarters right there is a 130 three quarter. Now that horse will stop, slow down, come back to where you saw the people standing and they'll they'll take a, a recovery heart rate. Meanwhile, uh, the rider is wearing a radio, uh, an FM radio, and from the side of the track there, the trainer, who is actually the owner in this case, uh, Terry Rush, is uh, calling his eights to him as the as the heat progresses so that the rider knows precisely how fast he's going eighth by eighth and uh, can judge then um, how uh, how much more to ask for or not to ask for. Basically, again, it's not a matter of asking. It's a matter of how much to let the horse out as it goes around the, uh, the racetrack. Um, all of the ob observations that are uh, normal with any trainer after a workout are uh, part of the routine. Uh, between heats. We look at the legs, we look at the uh, way the horse travels, we ask the rider how the horse feels, we look for any signs of nodding or any signs of uh, intolerance to the exercise in terms of respiration recovery, heart rate recovery, all of those things we want to see uh, before we go on to the next heat. And it's because we're doing uh, anywhere from 12 to 20 times the exercise that the typical thoroughbred uh, is able to achieve uh, we don't care if we have to uh, abort a workout and come back three or four days later and try it again. Uh, it doesn't bother us at all to do that because uh, our horses are doing plenty of work and there's no, there's no big hurry uh, to get this thing accomplished. Now, between these kinds of workouts, uh, we're doing uh, typically four-mile slow lopes on the days off and how many days off we give between workouts depends on uh, how the horse is uh, liking the workout. Sometimes uh, the first sign that you're beginning to get some exercise intolerance is the horse will go off, go off feed 
the evening of or the day after uh, one of these workouts. And if you see that, or if you see a weight drop, uh, or if you see agitation in the animal, or uh, misbehavior when it goes out on the track to uh, begin one of these workouts, uh, then you have to become concerned and you have to uh, open up the recovery process. In other words, if you're giving a workout like this every three or four days, uh, you might open it up to five days between workouts. And in fact, in this case, uh, this we're doing with um, uh, BB's Magic. Uh, she's on a five-day schedule at this point in time. She has been on a three-day schedule uh, prior to this, but uh, uh, she was losing some weight. We ran into a problem with this horse um, tying up somewhere in the middle of the multiple three-quarters, and it was uh, the situation, circumstances of it were that uh, we were getting down into some pretty high speeds, and we thought, hey, between these workouts, what we'll do is we'll cut back uh, the daily mileage to make sure that she's completely refueled and ready to fire on the next work day. So while she was doing four miles a day, we cut back to two miles a day. And uh, immediately she began to tie up and she had multiple episodes of tying up day after day and we uh, uh, talked to the veterinarian who advised that we uh, cut back the feed, cut back the work. And that didn't seem right. We <coughs> instead did, did exactly the opposite. We uh, bounced her back to four miles a day on the off days and increased her ration. And uh, she ceased tying up and never tied up again. And we've come to the conclusion that the key to avoiding tying up is consistency in uh, fuel usage or calorie burning uh, from day to day. If you instead uh, burn a lot of calories today and burn no calories tomorrow uh, you're going to be looking at a, at a tying up situation it has to do with uh, potassium balance uh, potassium cellular balance uh, I don't know what the chemistry involved is but I can tell you that uh, the key to avoiding tying up in in this kind of an exercise uh, situation is to uh, keep the overall workload, the overall fuel usage steady and constant rather than day on, day off, day on, day off. Um, it's real effective to do it to do it that way. The horse you'll find in the conversation with the uh, rider later on, this horse is pretty much of a push button horse, although uh, at this stage of the game she is racy full of fire, wants to race everything on the racetrack, uh, and has to be contained with, not with a grabbing up on the reins. If you grab up on the reins with this horse, uh, she'll just uh, grab a hold herself and it's a big battle to the wire. Instead, it's a matter of communicating through the reins. It's a matter of give and take. Uh, uh, hello, I'm here, I'm in control, but yeah, sure, go ahead and move a little bit. And, uh, and not, not fighting and not trying to hit uh, the exercise times precisely, but within a second or two of target times is fine. And again, you can always shut down a workout in the middle of the workout. So there's no need, no real need to do battle with the animal all the way around the racetrack. You get the horse going crooked, you get the horse taking missteps, and uh, after six to seven to eight months worth of hard work on everybody's part, one stupid move by the rider or by the horse uh, obliviates all that and you've, you've got yourself a bowed tendon or a cracked uh, shin or, or whatever. So uh, everything has to be under control uh, and all you can do to keep things under control you have to do and you have to spend the money to do it if it uh, if it means a radio with the rider if it means getting a better rider and paying that rider more money uh, whatever uh, the it takes you have to you have to do <clears throat> Okay, now we're seeing a uh, 12 second eight there. We're seeing a horse come onto the quarter pole. 
right there and 23 in a piece uh, on the other hand she looks like she's moving very quietly uh, very happy to do the work 3H and 35 in a piece half and 48 in a piece seven minute rest period between these five-eighths and 101 that was our target time for this uh, workout for the facets of these three quarters and 115 in a piece uh, it's a fine workout well controlled workout She'll come around uh, uh, slowly, uh, slowly slowing down uh, to have her heart rate taken. And then she'll do a mile and a half uh, warm down. And the reason we're doing the warm down is to uh, allow her muscle cells to squeeze out the remnants of lactic acid to, and, and any other waste products like ammonia that are uh, built up in the muscle cells. Squeeze those into the bloodstream, get them uh, process down through the kidneys and out of the body. Uh, we want to keep her uh, uh, moving so that uh, her recovery process is as quick and as uh, easy as possible. Prior to this workout, uh, she warmed up for two and a half miles of easy lope and then turned and went into her first heat. Again, the warm-up is uh, absolutely necessary uh, to get the blood flow moving through all those capillaries that are normally closed and inoperative uh, when the horse is at rest and it takes some considerable exercise to uh, open up the cardiovascular system, heat up the muscle cells, heat up the tendons and ligaments and make them more flexible, get the blood supply out there where it belongs, where it can deliver good uh, fuel and enzymes. So in this case this horse was warmed up and warmed down and then did uh, uh, three times three quarter workouts. One of the first fillies to be interval trained was Our Native Lover, trained by Mitch Thompson out of uh, Indiana. She had trouble getting out of the gate, as you can see, and we never cured her of that problem, but uh, we fit her up so that she overcame it at the end of the race. Watch, uh, we'll go ahead and let you listen to the call. Running fourth, up on the far outside, Melba Peach is fifth. Our Native Lover picks up horses in sixth. Hard knocking is running seventh, and then Revener is eighth. End of the trailer is Ya Takes, what you get. A move to the fire turn, and La Feather is the leader by three lengths. Now our native lover on the inside is running second. White Royalty alongside in third. A length in Aspen Lee J is fourth. A long gap to Melba Peach in fifth, and then it's back to Ya Takes, what you gets in sixth. And seventh is Hard Knocking, followed by Joy Miller, and the trailer is Revener. They are at the top of the home stretch, and the leader on the inside is our native lover. On the outside is White Royalty in second, La Feather is third. A furlong to the finish, our native lovers in front by a length and a half. White Royalty is running second, La Feather in third, Aspen Lee J is fourth. Our native lover is pulling away. With interval training, no one holds the destiny of your horse in his hands more than the rider. Here's an interview with a good one. Roll. Okay. John, uh, you've been riding horses for how long? Well, since 1942, about okay. 45 years. And who, you work for what trainers? Well, I worked for Green Tree, I worked for Brookmead, Calumet, uh, Max Hirsch. Some of the best trainers in the country. Now, Max Hirsch used to do some doubles once in a while, didn't he? Did you right. ever? Yeah. Right down in Columbia, South Carolina, when yeah. you know, at the fairgrounds down there, the winter training. Yeah. Johnny Tamaro uh, was telling me that he learned from Max Hirsch how to do back-to-back -back miles and back-to-back -back three quarters. Well, I'm I'm not too familiar with that because it's been back yeah. in the 40s, you know. Yeah. When I when I was working for them. Yeah. But uh, I would say that I've been riding actually 30 years or better. 
Have you ever seen this kind of, uh, this much work done with a horse? No, I haven't. Uh, I've seen, you know, different sorts of training, mm -hmm. different types of training. I mean, and uh, this here, actual, I've never really seen. Yeah. No. Now, when you first saw this filly going, uh, you uh, you were brought in and replaced a rider that was riding her because the filly was almost on the verge of getting away from uh, from that rider. Uh, when you watched that going on, you probably had some ideas as to how to change the way of riding to make this horse uh, uh, easier to handle. What what, right. what did you think about that? What, well, I was asked if I would want if I wanted to ride this particular horse, you know, and uh, being I had never seen it or done this here, it was interesting to me, you know, and I wanted to find out more about it, you know, and I felt that I could make the horse relax a little bit and control her, you know, and uh, so I accepted it. Mm -hmm. And then once I got on her, you know, I, to be honest with you, I tried to find fault because I was ready to say, you know, forget about it. Crazy kind of yeah, thing to do. Right, for right, you're wasting my time, and, yeah. and it's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, but as I gradually kept kept it going, I kept an open mind about it, and I realized that this sort of training was used on human beings for athletic training too. You know, and running and yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, the possibility is here, and it can be, you know, applied. And so that's the reason why I continued with it. And yeah. of course, I had a good relationship with the person that was training the horse. And I think that was very important. Yeah. You know, yeah. Of course, I tried to relate right from the beginning that I would be very honest, you know, and what I may say he may not like, mm -hmm. but I want him to be just as honest with me. Yeah. And that's the way it went. Yeah. You have to have a good relationship. How hard was it when you got down into the uh, real fast works where you had to be real precise, first of all, on the first heat not to let the horse go too fast, and then on the second heat to go right at the target time, and on the third heat to go right at the target time, which you were able to do. How hard was that for you to do? Well, I, I utilized the track, and I utilized her habit. Mm -hmm. See. I knew that her galloping was more or less towards the middle of the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And so my first work, you know, after I made a sneak off, I didn't make a rush off or anything, but we say 70 yards or 40 yards away from the pole, was in the middle of the racetrack where she thought she was just galloping. And that's where I brought her up to her pace. Yeah. See what I'm trying to say? And then my next work was, we say 15 foot off the rail. Mm -hmm. And then my third work was right on the rail. Okay. You know, so I, you know, compensated. Yeah. Um, did you ever find, uh, was she ever lame when you were No, writer? I've never found her to be lame, and that's what really turned me on to it, you know. I found she was, you know, good and sound, and, yeah. and she was strong. I think that was very And willing. And willing, you know, yeah. and she just was an all-around horse. The fastest workout that we've got on this tape is uh, uh, a three-three-quarter workout with the, uh, or three five eights with gallops out to three quarters, with the right. three quarter going in one fifteen and the uh, uh, five eights going in one oh one for the third heat. Um, at that point in time, how tired? I remember that on the way there we had a workout where we were going actually slower, somewhere around one nineteen for three quarters, and you felt at that time that the horse was right at its ability to go. In other words, it probably wouldn't want it, wanted to have gone faster than that. But on this final workout, how much more horse did you have at the end of that workout? Well, I had, an, I had, I had plenty of horse, you know, and this particular horse, let me put it to you like this here, once you set, it, set her on her pace, she'll stay to that pace, mm -hmm. you know, and she's very sensitive about her mouth, and when you move your hands or your body, she picks up on it, you mm -hmm. know? and uh, I had no problem doing it. In fact, she almost sneaked away from me mm -hmm. by, we say, a fifth, two fifths of a second. Yeah, you know, and that's after I'd gone already a quarter of a mile. Yeah, I mean, she's so smooth, you know, and uh, I found no problems with it. You know? And she pulled now, up well. Well, the horse that's like this. Let's say that that workout would have been the last workout, or you've been 
getting close to single breezes and this type of thing and feeling what that horse felt like and you've ridden thousands and thousands of yeah. horses. Uh, let's say that this horse was put into a race that went a mile and eight uh, and you were the jockey. Uh, how would you ride a race that had uh, good stakes level competition in it? How would you ride this kind of a horse and would it be the same as you'd ride any other horse or is this horse different and you know what would your tactics be in a race with this kind of an animal? Well, first of all, I would I would know that she'd be able to keep that certain pace. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I would have a, a sense of rating on her. I mean, I wouldn't try to keep up with the pack and everything. I knew yeah. that when I asked. I think what is most important was that she can keep that constant speed. Yeah. Whatever you set her in, you know. And when you say, you know, stake, stake horse mm -hmm. or good good horses. Yeah. <coughs> I I really don't know. You know what I mean? Because I've never actually been into it. Yeah. You know I mean, but don't know whether she's a stake horse or not. Right. But exactly. You know. Well, her level of fitness would tell you that uh, you could plug her in and she'd she'd keep going. For as far as you know, she was supposed to go. Yeah. I'm yeah. not saying a mile, a mile and eight, or whatever you want to say. I'm saying for what you conditioned her for. Like yeah. You say you had your five eight works and. Yeah galloping out to three quarters, she'd be ready for three quarters, seven eighths of a mile. Yeah. I mean now you're asking her to go a mile, mile and eight. Yeah. You know I mean, which is an extended you know. Yeah. And she's only conditioned to go a certain you know, length or yeah. distance. Okay, now our thoughts are and the what the in the in the uh, philosophy of interval training is that those multiple heats, because the heat before it was pretty close to the same speed and the heat before that was not slow, it was certainly faster than a two minute lick, uh, that we can uh, tie those heats together with those short seven minute rest periods between them and get a horse that uh, can go further than she's being trained to go. In other words, uh, if you throw a three quarter at her in 115 uh, to race three quarter, that's one thing. but three three quarters with short rest period between uh, add up to a horse that can not only go to three quarters but can probably stick that extra quarter or extra uh, to a mile and eighth somewhere around there. She's targeted according to the conditioning program at a mile and eighth. Now do you think that that's not possible with this horse or do you think that she could go a mile and eighth and, and stay the whole mile and eighth? Well I'm going to have to disagree with you. I'm going to tell you the reason why, because in racing, I mean, you condition a horse for how far you want it to go, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I mean, by you saying three quarters and then you ask him to go a mile and an eighth, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Which is another, we say three eighths of a mile, Yeah. you know? And uh, <coughs> she, she's not in the habit of going that far, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? She's in the habit of going three quarters of a mile. Yeah. You can extend her to a seven eighths of a mile. Yeah. I mean, and you know you'd get a good race from her. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you're just experimenting to see if the horse can do it, well, go right ahead. I'm sure that she won't break down yeah. on you. You know what I mean? I mean, and she may make a good showing. Yeah. You know, she has the speed to carry it. There's no doubt about it. But the point is, is you know, is she conditioned for it? Mm -hmm. You know. It's your opinion that she would be conditioned. Yeah. I mean, I can't form an opinion. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Okay. Let's say, let's say that we had another horse that uh, was brought along uh, the training process in the normal way. Right. Uh, that horse would be typically go out, and the first breeze it would do would be maybe a quarter mile. Right. Then it might go three eighths. Right. Then it might go always a half out. and yeah, always galloping out. Right. Uh, and then it might go a half and maybe three five eighths. Right. These are all separated by about uh, five days, six days between. Right. Uh, and then it would race at three quarters. Right. Uh, but eventually, if it was winning and doing well and progressing up the uh, ladder, it would eventually have to race at a mile and an eighth. Well, what they or do a mile and a quarter at the Kentucky Derby, for example. Well, what they do is. Uh, the trainer will always tell the jock mm -hmm. that when he has intentions of going further with the horse mm -hmm. is to let him gallop out after he, fin after he crosses the wire. In other words, preparing him for his next race, you know what I mean? So instead of going three quarters, he'll be going seven eighths of a mile in mm -hmm. actuality. And then, of course, you know, the training will be 
for a mile, you know what I mean? Yeah. They'll be shooting at a mile to go, say, a mile and eight. Yeah. You follow me? In other words, he's always preparing ahead of time okay. to go So what you're saying is if this horse had done the third heat of three, three quarters, and galloped out to a mile, then it probably would have been ready for a mile right. eight. Right, right, okay. exactly. You know what I mean? okay. And of course, once you put the speeds into them, mm -hmm. you know, then you you know what you have. Yeah. Right? Then now you know the she's next well plans for this horse are is that she uh, drops on down to single works. Now, we, because we're doing three heats uh, right now, we don't bring her all the way to racing rates, right. and we don't bring her to racing distances because three heats is a lot, a lot more right. work than just one heat. Tremendous is. amount of work. So uh, the next step with her is to start doing singles, and the first thing we'll uh, we'll attempt is we've got to break her from the gate a couple times at the racetrack to get her started, but uh, we'll see some more speed. In other words, we want to get down so that she can hit maybe 58, 4, or 5 eighths. Uh, There's no doubt she can yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. And then we may try uh, the uh, Woody Stevens prep, which is go long, go shorter, go shorter, go shorter, and go to the races. Okay? Right. So you taper back and taper back and taper right. back. Meanwhile, way back here, you started with the full racing distance at slower rates than you would go the race, but the whole right. the whole racing distance. So we well, might she's try. conditioned to go that. Yeah, so that she's seen it, right. and that she tapers down from that and just kind of builds her firepower up so that by the time she gets down to, let's say, a half mile breeze, she's three or four days from a race. Right. And at that time, she'll should, according to the philosophy, have uh, firepower for a mile and eighth or whatever we target her for. Right. Okay. So right. that's also a part of the process you haven't gone through yet. That that may, I think, by the time you do this, Philly, go all the way through that with her. I think that you'll see there is that tail end of it. You'll see that um, way back here when we're trying to change. Uh, <coughs> muscle cells. We're trying to change uh, the mitochondria that are in those muscle cells that burn oxygen that make her able to stay. All of those changes are still there later on when we're doing our speed works and we're doing our singles to get it. And we built all of that now and it won't go away even if we have to lay her off or we have to uh, take a couple weeks off anytime we want to. We can back off. All that structural stuff will stay there and then firing her up, fueling up her muscle cells for that final race will, uh, will be easily done as opposed to s trying to stretch a horse. You know how it is when you're trying to stretch a horse to the Kentucky Derby? He's last year's six furlong champion and now he's got to stretch out. And most of those last year's 109 six furlong horses don't stretch out to a mile and a quarter. Right. Can't. And the reason that they can't is because they're already trained to sprint. They, they, they've been trained so hard to sprint that the structures in their muscles are set up to sprint. And it's yeah. hard, to, much harder to change the structures than it is to fuel up the muscle cells. Right. Okay, so. right. Dent Caton is an interval trainer who trains out of San Francisco at Bay Meadows and Golden Gate, sometimes races down in Santa Anita. He did a study of 41 of his horses, uh, 11 of which were interval trained, and he found uh, the following. Of the interval trained horses, 100% started, while the national average is 65%. The interval trained horses earned $2,427 per start compared to $1,000 per start for the national average. 100% of the interval trained horses won races, where typically 64% win. 82% of the interval trained horses won multiple races, where the national average is 28%. 27% of the interval trained horses won stakes races, the national average is 2%. Now, of the siblings, in other words, the babies out of the same mare, and each of these horses had an average of 5.6 siblings of the same age group who started, 36% of the interval trained horses were the best sibling. 73% of the interval trained horses were the best or the second best sibling. 
Now, when we're talking about interval training with Dent Caton Stable, we're also talking about uh, the same kind of interval training that Barry Wexler does in Florida. And these processes uh, are uh, about half the uh, workloads that uh, we've outlined on this, on this videotape. Typically, uh, Dent would uh, finish up his process with three or four times one half mile workouts. He'd do double, um, little, uh, double three quarter workouts, double mile workouts, uh, typically twice a week, this type of thing. Later on, we'll see Hermes run, and uh, Hermes was a screaming sprinter, and Hermes was built uh, shooting eight times uh, 220 uphill. Um, intervals are actually those were repetitions they were short screaming sprints and that you know what you what you start out to build and the exercise specificity of what you're doing is uh, what you can expect to receive on the other end of a conditioning program so all of the uh, uh, documentation here from uh, Dent Caton stable and uh, all of the success that uh, Barry Wexler has had with image of greatness and another 20 spectacular stakes winning horses uh, these animals were, were built with exercise protocols far less uh, extensive than uh, what we're talking about on this on this tape interval training is uh, a toolbox of a thousand tools and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, uh, my way uh, and I'm sure that uh, you after you've uh, viewed this tape and had some experience I'm sure you're going to find that you can develop uh, an even better conditioning protocol than than I have. Uh, this tape is merely a guide to show you that uh, here is a process that we know works, that we know uh, horses can survive, and uh, it's up to you then to go on with it, uh, catch up to what we've what we've been able to do, but then go on and. Uh, uh, modify and uh, change around uh, the protocols to uh, fit your horses and to fit your own uh, stable situation. Uh, more is always better, uh, but then that's more very carefully done. And the thing you should know about interval training or any kind of an exercise protocol is that if you don't put the background, if you don't build the foundation, then you can't expect to come on at the end or the specific race training, the high speed exercise with a very big volume because you will uh, destroy the horse. Most of the errors made in interval training uh, have been made by people who uh, blindly decided that their horses, if my horses could do uh, four times three quarters, well then sure as hell their horses could do four times three quarters. Uh, and they went right into that without uh, considering, uh, and, and with racehorses too that were already racing, without considering that their horses were completely unready for that level of, exer of exertion and crashed the horses. Uh, one, one trainer uh, has uh, said that uh, he crippled uh, 50 horses with interval training. Well, uh, what kind of mentality is that? If you uh, cripple one, uh, you start to wonder if you're right. If you cripple two, uh, my tendency uh, would be to get out of the horse raising business. I would, I would think that I'm uh, too damn dumb to go on with any kind of training. 50, crippling 50, uh, means that uh, the person uh, was, not, was not thinking at all. Um, and you can't do this. You have to cautious, cautiously approach any kind of an exercise protocol. And just know that the nice thing about interval training is it's infinitely variable. You can do uh, anything you want to do. You can shape workouts that have a half mile, two, three quarters, and a half mile. You can do six times a half like we do with the standard breads. Uh, we need to hone them more than we do thoroughbreds. Uh, you can do uh, workouts that are triple miles. Uh, you can do double mile, back to back, double headers, uh, two or three times a week. You get a uh, from that you get a, a, a horse uh, like Saratoga Passage who has been through that kind of a conditioning uh, program. Uh, 
you know, you can, it's however number of many heats you want to do, whatever rest period you want to use, however fast you want to go, how often you want to uh, do the workouts per week. Uh, all those are variables that are uh, manipulable by you. And uh, the job is to shape the work protocol to deliver the final product you're looking for. If you want a horse that'll go a mile and a half in 224, it's going to take one kind of workout. If you want a horse that'll go six furlongs in 107, it's going to take a different kind of, a completely different kind of a, a work protocol. So what we're looking at here is uh, your choice. Uh, just following the general principles of exercise physiology and that's what we're trying to do trying to show you with this tape is that uh, there are principles there are laws that you have to obey and one of the laws is if you want to do a lot of high-speed work later on you're going to have to do a lot of background mileage early on and you're going to have to walk step by step slice by slice through the conditioning program one another big error that people make is they go halfway through with the cardiovascular process and then chicken out sneak down into those quarter mile breezes once every five days and uh, try to build a quarter miler then a three-eighths horse then a, f a half miler then five furlongs then try to race five and a half furlongs or six furlongs uh, what you're doing there is you're not building the oxidative capacity in those fast twitch muscle cells and so you'll never get a good staying horse and you're going to drop into speed too fast too soon and you're liable to uh, injure the horse with a speed while not developing high speed staying power uh, it's one of the bigger mistakes you can make and still call yourself uh, an interval trainer one of the uh, interesting aspects of the fellow who crippled, uh, supposedly crippled 50 horses with interval training is that he called me out to his farm because he said his heart rate meter wasn't working one day. And I went out there and it's down in Southern California, the temperature is 110 degrees and he's out there in the middle of the afternoon working out these horses. And uh, the horses are coming off the track blowing like freight trains, uh, staggering and... Uh, but they're having uh, uh, normal heart rate recoveries. In other words, the exercise is not building high levels of lactate, uh, and the horse then is not uh, having to uh, maintain a high heart rate to recover from that, but still the blowing rate is like a freight train. In other words, uh, he's uh, the horse is trying to dissipate heat, uh, and the fellow can see that the horse is ready to die but the heart rate meter is telling him the horse is ready to go on so he can't uh, understand why his heart rate meter is not working and that's just one of the small subtle situations you can run into without uh, if you don't know what you're doing you can get into big trouble without knowing all these aspects There's Dent Caton in the winter circle. Good for Dent. I was, gonna, I was just going to go ahead. I was just going to I mean, when you say, you know, that you want to uh, lay her off, we say a couple of weeks, you know, mm -hmm. and then you want to fire her up again. I mean, once you back a horse up, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing is really, you know, uh, gathering fat tissues and so mm -hmm. forth that you have to burn out again. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and uh, get her breathing back in. Yeah, exactly. Right. But the fuels, the the thing about muscles is that the fuels are the easiest thing to change. In other words, you could probably take a fat horse out of a paddock that wasn't too heavy and bring it to speed, if you didn't care whether the legs fell off or not, bring it to speed pretty quick with a couple three-eighths breezes a week. You could pretty much get that horse to do three-eighths in 36, not very long out of the paddock, okay? That fuel comes back quick, that firepower comes back quick. What doesn't change as quickly is that internal muscle 
structure that allows the horse to uh, stay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the fact, yeah, she'll uh, in two weeks off. Probably the first week, she gets real bright and real wants to go and gets nervous and uh, is just almost uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. The second week, she settles down and gets a little bit lazy in her muscles and in her mind. Uh, you bring her back from that, and it takes about that same two weeks to fire her back up and get her lit for a, a, a race. So that's not as hard to change as if the horse has been standing in a, st in a stall for nine months and has not done any work. Then you got a big problem, A, getting a speed going, getting those legs smart again, getting her mind smart again, and B, getting her internal musculature to uh, adapt so she can carry her speed for a long for a long route. And that's why we did all this. You know, she's been through, I don't know how many miles she's been through, but uh, more than a thousand miles of uh, this kind of uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of changes. Go ahead. Uh, what I was going to say was, you know, uh, as you remember, I said that Training her was similar to training a human being. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Rocky Marciano was probably the, the most fittest man you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. you know, and he constantly stayed fit, even even when he was not, not boxing. Yeah. He was always into staying fit. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I'm not familiar with this interval training, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm trying to grasp it, you know, and I'm trying to relate. You know, and uh, it's, well, it's a, probably against my habit, you know, mm -hmm. of seeing horses and uh, to back up too far with this horse. Yeah, sure. Or with any horse. Sure. And then try to ask this horse to come on again you know, yeah. in, in a short distance of time. And in fact, the Without fillies tend to resent backing off. Uh, exactly. They, when they yeah. lose their edge, they tend to get, uh, put their ears back and say, how come you did that to me? Right, and which is another thing that I've also brought out. Now, we're working with a filly. Mm -hmm. And uh, a filly has a tendency to get sour on you yeah. much quicker than a colt, you know, yeah. because, you know, that their menstrual periods and so yeah. forth. I mean, and it's amazing how this horse says, and I think she convinced me more than anything that this system can be applied, you know. Because she doesn't get sour. She hasn't got sour so far. No, she's, yeah. she's went into a little state of relaxation, yeah. like too, too much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're concerned about it. Yeah. Right. She relaxes and is not under heavy stress. Uh, she will uh, come down off her high, right. off her exercise right. high, right. and uh, not be racy. Right. But then coming back, well, she'll she'll tell tell be, we call it the adrenaline. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you would call it in the uh, in the thoroughbred. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when the adrenaline you know ceases to flow yeah. you know, at a high rate, we calm down. You know? Yeah. But I think that's what we do psychologically. We build up this adrenaline, yeah. and that's how we were able to perform. Well, that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's enzymes, okay? Right. Adrenaline triggers a lot of enzymes. Right. And those, when those enzymes are spun up in the muscle cells, right. you've got a lot of firepower waiting to right. uh, the to match to be lit to it. Right. Once you stop exciting uh, that muscular system with right. exercise, then everything calms down, the enzymes uh, go away and uh, have to be re-excited again right. later on before, you, before you're before you ready. Right. Uh, like I notice with this filly, like I'll go out and I'll see that she's building herself up, she's building yeah. it up and building it up, and the further you go with her, the, the more, you know, yeah. excitable she'll become, yeah. you know, and yeah. she's ready. When you go between workouts, from one workout to the next, uh, most, I think most trainers might think that a workout like this would knock a horse out uh, for several days. And one of the things that we do, rather than the day after uh, not just walking the horse, we go right back out the next day and we'll do four miles or as many miles as we think is right for the horse. But every day, except for Sundays, she does some kind of significant exercise. Well, there, you, well, there again, you've conditioned it for this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And. Uh, just like Rocky Marciano, yeah. even when he wasn't boxing or what he, you know, wasn't getting ready for a fight, he still stayed physically fit. Yeah. And this is what you're doing with the, this particular horse. You, you're keeping her yeah. fit. I mean, so and you're, you're you can habit. see with her, like the day after, she may be a little bit. Uh, we may have knocked her edge off with the workout the day before. Well, not so necessarily. Not necessarily. She's not necessarily. Okay. You know, uh, the, the best I could do is ask, is how did she come out of it? Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. And because you can tell through different means, you know, yeah. feed and whatnot, and yeah. the way she acts in the store, you know. And uh, she comes out of it pretty good. Do you notice any difference between, or let's say, the day before when you gallop four miles easy and the day after a workout when you gallop four miles easy? Is there any difference in her attitude? Well, she's things? in a relaxed state. She knows she's not going to, you know, I think she's yeah. into a habit, you know, which, mm -hmm. which horses have a tendency to become very habit forming, you know. Mm -hmm. And like she could almost sense when it's time to work. Like uh, we have the phones on, you know, yeah. and she could hear that there, that antenna rattling up there. Yeah. Well, she knows that something's up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right, she does. I mean, it's surprising, you know, but it, they say a horse doesn't have intelligence. I yeah. believe that they do, you know. Yeah. She knows that there's something going to be done, you know. And she listens to all of this here. She looks, you know, all the cues. Yeah. You know what I mean? She can tell by me getting ready, you know, jacking my irons up, yeah. you know. And she said, well, this is it, you know. Yeah. And when I don't do these things, she'll put herself into a yeah. relaxed state. And sometimes, like, you know, we're at the poles that we're used to breaking her off at, mm -hmm. she will become a little excited, you know. Yeah. She will try to, you know, get away from that pole, yeah. you know. No now, when she does do that, when she does grab a hole and start to right. take off, how do you prevent her from going too fast on that first slow heat? Well, what I try to do is I try to uh, keep my steady hold on her, you know, let her know that she's not going anyplace, you know what I mean? And don't panic, just relax on her, you know, and make her go back to relax. Yeah. I mean, you know, it'll take a few jumps, or say strides, but she will come back to you, you know? Yeah. Once she knows she is, she's not going nowhere, you know, but she's ready. Yeah. That because that's the habit. She, she's breaking at that pole, you know. Now, what would happen if you just grabbed up on her? She'd break off on you and go. Okay. I mean, she is that strong. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not only her, but most horses are, are much stronger than the rider, you know. Yeah. And if you reached up, that would be it. That's her signal to go. Yeah. You know, now you got to fit. Yeah. And she's ready. And yeah, she she's ready to do it, you know. There's no question about it. So on a day after a workout, you're not necessarily finding her to be dull no, or lethargic not, or anything no, like that. No, in fact, you know, yeah. she'll get on the muscle a little bit, you know. Let's let's say when we, you see how we're doing this is we're slicing a little speed off every workout, okay? And basically that means that you're kind of holding her back from what you know she could do right. all the time and probably from what she really wants to do right. all the time. And that takes a real good set of hands to do that. Yeah. Now you take your average rider at a racetrack, yeah. uh, from my observation at the racetrack, what I see is quite a few basically out of control horses. Horses mm -hmm. that the guys are standing up on, leaning way back on yeah. the stirrups and got the horse's uh, yeah. chin into his chest and this kind yeah. of just to, to hold the horse back. Now. We want something other than that. What we want is a horse that does has the enthusiasm to go ahead and explode and be competitive, but can stay under control and do a workout that is gradually, slice by slice, mm. brought down to racing speed so she doesn't buck her shin, she doesn't mm. pop her knee, she doesn't bow a tendon, mm. but just little by little gets introduced to that speed. Now, how hard for someone like myself going to a racetrack and just and trying to pick the best rider that I can, how hard a time am I going to get a rider that can do what you have done with this filly? Well, if you'll notice, most riders today, they want to be, you know, showing it, so they wear gloves. Yeah. And to me, that's a no-no, no, no, because the, there's where it's at, you yeah. know. It's right in your hands. you got to feel in the mouth, you yeah. know. And uh, most riders want to get done. They're not concerned about the horse. They don't yeah. really care what happens. As long as they get done, you know what I yeah. mean? Get on I mean, another horse. Right, get on another horse, make that extra money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, they're not really interested in, in performing. Regulating their own so In their performing the, you know, the exact you know, work that's supposed to be required. Yeah. I mean, all they're interested in is you know, getting it over with as fast as possible. If they get a rough horse, you know, they try to get over even faster. Yeah. You know? And they'll use every means, whatever possible, you know, to get it done as quick as possible. So, how does the average trainer find well, someone like you who is willing to go ahead and do the uh, work? Pay pay more money, or yeah, what is it? yeah, you'd have to. I mean, because you, you can anybody can you know can ride a horse. Yeah, and, and there are. I mean, there are good riders. I mean, you know, but the the question now, the bottom line again is money. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, why should a rider have to go through this here, you know, extra work and 
be exact and put a lot of effort in when he can get just as much doing half as little. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so this way he's going to, and I think I brought that out, you know, that. It's a lot more work. It's a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. I mean, really, it is. I mean, On that third yes. heat, are you finding yourself wondering whether urine is good <laughs> in enough condition? Sometimes, to, yeah. sometimes, you know, but most of the time, you know, it's like getting on three different, you know, horses. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. you're getting on three different horses, even though it's the same horse, because you're doing three different works, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the amount of time that's, you know, it's elapsed. And uh, same as you're on a racetrack, now you're getting $7 a head. Yeah, right. right. And you can get right. on three different horses. That's twenty-one dollars, and right. bing, you get them done. And you don't know? have to do a warm-up right. or anything like right. that. You, you just spin them around right. the track. Right. And you get them it. done, you know. So I mean, there's the difference, you know. Yeah. I mean, it really is. You know, you have to be able to. Now I have a. I have my own opinion is that a competent rider, a decent rider, can basically stop. Any horse. In other words, uh, if he, if there is a if there is a horse that wants to drag you around the racetrack, and you know that, then even before you go on the horse, you can go tell a trainer, "Hey, I want protection. I want a figure eight. I want something on this horse that right, I can grab a hold kind of." of bit, yeah, not, not, you know. So that a competent rider right, can, should never yeah. have a horse run away from him. You know, unless well, it's a, a, a yeah, crazy unless the brain sport. breaks or something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Start, <laughs> start buying buses or something. You know. Yeah. Yeah, well, a, a competent rider, a good rider, or a, a rider has been around, he has different methods of, you know, making a horse. In other words, he can sense when that horse gets out of control. Yeah. In other words, there's a point of no return. Yeah. Before you reach that point of no return, I mean, a decent rider knows what to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? How to slow that horse back up. You yeah. know what I mean? You get my point, my point. Yeah. Right so a lot of times we run into a situation point. here where when we had you out doing uh, three times three quarters, and you went 129, 122, I guess, and 115, uh, a lot of riders get on that horse and go to the 115, the first heat, because they say the horse ran away with them. You yeah, know, well, a lot of times they use that as an excuse. How important so. is the rider in? And that's, again, my philosophy that the rider is your most sensitive monitoring instrument. In other words, the rider is the first to know that a horse isn't right for either lameness or for mental or uh, digestive, you know, just about anything that you want to know about a horse, a rider out there on the racetrack feels it first, before the vet, before the trainer can see it, and a lot of times before my exotic instruments can pick it up. Well, most riders don't don't concern themselves with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I said before, they just want to get done as fast as possible, and they're not concerned about the horse or what it's supposed to do. You know, just get it done. You know, uh, if you take an interest in the horse and you have a good relationship again with the trainer, you know, and you can you can tell as soon as you get on them. You know what I mean? Because if you especially if you're familiar with the horse, yeah. you know, I mean, you can actually feel their moods. You know. Yeah. And uh, and as I said, a good relationship, you know, you can express yourself. Listen, I don't think this horse, you know, is up to it today, or yeah. it's going a little sore, or, you know, it's uh, kind of sluggish, you know. You know, I mean, you can relate. Yeah. A lot of times, there's a lot of things I'd like to tell a trainer, but I say, what's the sense of even telling him because, <laughs> right. you know, he's not going to pay any attention anyhow. You know, he's going to put it over his shoulder. Yeah. You know what I mean? Have you ever been like with Max Hirsch or with any of the people you ever worked with? Have you ever found trainers that were very interested in what you uh, had to say about what each horse yes, got like? Yes, yes, like uh, Bobby Dada, mm -hmm. uh, Leroy Jolly. You know, mm -hmm. people that were really into their training. You know, I mean that they had their, you know, good background into yeah. training. I mean, and and you know they have been good. Like, I don't know if I should use the name, but. Like, he was a bookkeeper and he becomes a trainer. Yeah. He has no conception at all about yeah. training horses, you know. So, I mean, what can I relate to him? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the only thing I can say, if he asked me, I'd say, yeah, the horse went great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. that ends all conversations. Right. Everybody's you know? happy after that. Right. <laughs> right. The horse went terrific. Um, John, let's talk about economics for a minute. Okay. Uh, first of all, we know that we're going to have to pay a rider more to do this kind of work. Exactly. Um, how much more? Uh, three horses worth, or what? Well, when you say you're going to have to pay a, a rider more, first you're going to have to find a rider that's going to be interested in this interval training. Of course, most riders are going to say, look, I'm not interested in it. I don't want to get involved. You know? But when you find a rider that would become interested, 
you know what I mean? Mm. Then you could, you know, ask him what he thinks is appropriate, yeah. you know, wage, and uh, and add a little more to it. Yeah. You know, show him that, you know, that you'll meet him more than halfway. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. saying. In other words, he becomes then interested. So well, these yeah. people are really into it, you know. And like they pick up on this here right away, you know. As soon as I get to an outside horse, like I grab the trainer, you know, I said, yeah. listen, I could tell right away if this guy is, you know, into his horse, he's not into his horse, he wants to get the job done, his gait, and whatever he's yeah. doing, you know, just by sense, you know. Now, one of the hassles with this is uh, uh, we're using heart rate monitors on, on some of the horses where you have to look at a watch right. and call out the heart rate. We're also using uh, the radios that you've been wearing right. where uh, uh, Terry would, would be talking to you over the radio and telling right. you how fast you're going per right. rate. Right. Uh, that's annoying, I'm sure, to be wearing that, but no, how it's what not. do you think about it? No, I don't think it's annoying. In fact, I think it's very helpful. and you know. And I appreciate, you know, having it on, and I think it's very important that the person on the other end is communicating, you know, yeah. and uh, and make sure it, it doesn't. The rider doesn't have to, you know, communicate to the one that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's the one that's on the ground has to keep that constant communication going. Yeah. And this way, he has the confidence. The rider has the confidence in the one that's on the ground. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not to get excited. You know? Yeah. I think that's, you know, a good relationship there again. You know, between what do you think about the relationship when we say that the rider has uh, the authority and the uh, uh, freedom to stop a workout any time, and that's basically the instructions you've gone out with as well, that any time the horse gives up, the workout's over. And so when you feel that, if you ever feel that, hopefully we're right. doing exercises right. that don't cause that, but if it, you have the right to do right. that, well, that even, should be the even right. Even in conventional work. training, I mean, yeah. the rider always has that, that option, you know, to call it. I mean, say, hey, listen, this is it. The horse yeah. you know, doesn't feel right. He's really, you know, bad. Yeah. But I mean, especially in this interval training, yeah. I mean, if he's totally honest with the trainer, yeah. you know what I mean, and he can, rather than make a show or try to make a show, and pull that horse up and then take the consequences, you know. Yeah. Uh, there again, the trainer, he's got to be reasonable, he's got to be understanding, and I say, why, or, you know, maybe you made a uh, bad judgment, yeah. you know what I mean? He's got to have confidence in his yeah. rider, you know what I mean? He definitely has to have confidence Yeah, the in rider him. is on the horse. Right, and, and so he must have confidence in him, yeah. uh, which it, this is not necessarily true in conventional training, you know. The trainer does not have confidence in the rider, you know. Yeah. He's just looking to get the job done. Yeah. So he's just looking to get the horse Putting trained. Putting the body on the horse. Right. You know, best way possible, you know. Yeah. And so more times than not, he'll compensate for the lack of communication and uh, let it go at that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas interval training is more communication involved. Economically, this process uh, is not a 90-day process. It's a, a probably with an aged horse, uh, a minimum of six months' time from beginning to end, right. and with a baby, nine months to a year. Sometime. Right, that's, that, that's the big emphasis that, you know, it's got to be put across. I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, hear this, even though you may tell them this, you know, look, it's going to take X amount of time, more so than, the, you know, the conventional way of training a horse. And they'll say, yeah, don't worry about, it. you know, take whatever time you want. And then before you know it, when the 90 days are up, they're saying, how come my horse is not ready to yeah. run, you know? Right. And now you're pulling your hair out because now you're in between, you know, yeah. two hard rocks. Yeah. You know, trying to get the horse ready and then trying to satisfy him to get the horse there to the races, you know? Yeah. So it's got to be stressed that, you know, this is not the, you know, the normal way of training. This yeah. is a new method. I mean, it's new to racing. It may be, uh, like I said, I've never, you know, really been across this. I'm sure that they have used it in other know areas yeah. areas but I think that's the big thing and you got to tell the owners you know beforehand exactly the way it's going to be and you got to stick to it you know there they go Top value, value breaks, breaks from the lead, the lead. on the on outside. The outside. That is that now see this in second. second. Proper, Proper look on the outside, outside is third. Down along the rail, Machida is fourth. Change five. 
Race is in to six. Normyra is next, followed by I'll Have the Tab. On the outside is Reasonable Profit. They're around the clubhouse turn on the outside top value. In front, three quarters along the rail. Now see this. Second to length and one half. Proper look races third. Two and a half lengths. Chains five is fourth to length and one half. Machida. Fifth by head, Normyra, sixth by head. I'll have the tab and on the outside, reasonable profit. They race towards the half mile and at his top. Value in front by length and one half. Now see this race is second by half. Proper look along the rail, third, two and a half lengths. Change five, fourth by length. On the inside, Normyra is fifth by head. Machida is next. I'll have the tab and reasonable profit. They turn for home. Top value has it by two lengths. That's uh, now see this under the whip and driving into second. Along the rail, proper look is third. Here comes Norm Ira moving to the outside with a roll on. Here comes Norm Ira. Change five runs fifth. They're in the stretch with top value in front. Two and a half lengths, Norm Ira under the left-handed whip coming on. Here comes Norm Ira. It's top value in front, Norm Ira driving hard on the outside. And Russell's got him, Norm Ira on the outside, now takes the lead with top value second. It's Norm Ira in front. At the wire number one, Norm Ira wins it by length number six, top value second by two. As I sit here editing, going through the final editing process of this tape, I'm sitting in front of about 30 wind pictures that have been sent to me from around the country. Thoroughbreds, quarter horses, standard breads, Arabians. These are people that uh, did interval training and won races with their horses. Most of them are small people, a uh, few horses in training, uh, some owner trainers. Um, their horses went through the entire process, came out the other end, athletes, and none of the animals represent expensive uh, yearling purchases. None of the animals represent uh, high-class uh, racing prospects from the yearling uh, point of view. All are moderate priced. I would say that there's probably not a horse up here that costs more than $30,000. And when you see these horses racing here, uh, you can see that uh, certainly uh, many hundreds of horses have completed this uh, interval training program, survived it, gone on to race and win. Uh, some have won grade one stakes. Uh, I think that the total now, and I don't have the slightest idea how much actual winnings there are with interval trained horses, but I know for sure that there are, that it's approaching $10 million that I know about uh, in horses, not only in this country, but uh, overseas. We know that uh, Michael Stout in England, uh, and I'm not counting his horses as uh, in my dollar figures, but we know for sure that uh, his animals have uh, all been interval trained. Uh, he doesn't call it interval training, but he shoots three or four heats up those grassy hills and uh, delivers winner after winner, top trainer in Europe. And I'm sure there are several other trainers over there who are doing interval type workouts. In Australia, we've got Colin Hayes, who uh, makes a regular habit of winning the Melbourne Cup, as well as being the top uh, money-winning thoroughbred, thoroughbred trainer in Australia. We know that at one time, D. Wayne Lucas was doing intervals. Uh, the last horse that uh, we know about uh, that was interval trained in his stable was Althea. Uh, she was shooting triple halves down at uh, San Luis Ray Downs in Southern California. Uh, Wayne has been interviewed about uh, interval training and his statements uh, appearing in the California Thoroughbred uh, were to the effect that it's about time everybody started catching on to what we've been doing for years. Now, I'm sure that uh, Dean Wayne Lucas is not interval training horses at this point because he's got too many and, uh, and really doesn't have to do the work uh, that he used to have to do to come out ahead. Nevertheless, uh, in standard breads, we've got three or four million dollars worth of, well, four or five million dollars worth of wins with some real top champions involved there. In thoroughbreds, the same. Uh, we have uh, 
champion Arabian racehorses, uh, interval trained, um, virtually every horse that has been that has raced prior to interval training and then been interval trained has improved drastically. In standard breads, we can count on four seconds worth of extra performance with every interval trained horse that just goes through a crash prep six week crash prep it, it almost invariably happens we're not as tight and as sure of ourselves in the standard bread uh, game or in the quarter horse game because we don't have as much experience but nevertheless uh, the evidence exists that uh, interval training is a much more appropriate way of building equine athletes just like it is a much more appropriate way of building uh, human athletes and in time uh, eventually we're going to see that interval training protocols uh, designed however they're going to be designed by the people who come after us uh, are going to be the ones that take down the stakes all you have to remember is that a 138 horse yeah, thoroughbred is worth about thirty thousand dollars. A one thirty three miler is worth about thirty million dollars, and conditioning can make the difference. Thank you for buying this tape. I appreciate your business. You're keeping me alive. And I'll come back with more information for you as I gather it. We plan a series of tapes that go deep into all aspects of conditioning and sports medicine applications, not just interval training. So we hope you'll remain a good customer for us. Thank you very much for buying this tape.